Uh, thank you, everybody. Welcome to uh, Unreleased NES Games. My name is Frank Zafaldi. I'm the founder of the Video Game History Foundation. Uh, we're a 501c3 nonprofit dedicated to preserving video game history. Uh, basically, what we like to say is that we want to make sure that historians and storytellers have the tools they need to tell the story of video games. Um, and a lot of that, uh, a lot of the stuff we focus on tends to be the more weird, ephemeral things. So something I get asked a lot is, you know, are you, oh, hey, I've got these Atari games. Do you want to interpret those? And my answer is always, no, the pirates took care of those decades ago. That's fine. What we tend to focus on are things that, uh, you, the, well, the, the sort of shortcut I give people for what we look for is, uh, could you not buy it? Great, that's what we're after. Because uh, you know, when we're talking about like the making of a video game, uh, what 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 would benefit an historian are things like behind the scenes materials. You know, the original design documentation, the concept art, the source code itself. Uh, but even beyond the making of the games, uh, I feel that. Uh, being able to talk about how a game was sold is important to understanding that game. So being able to access the marketing for it, being able to to uh, to see, you know, if there were commercials that were, that were ran for the game, like like how did Konami market Symphony of the Night in America? I don't know the answer to that actually, but um, you know, like I I think you can tell interesting stories about that. And actually, one of the best examples I can give of that is it's not for marketing. Like we kind of extend this also to. Uh, um, publications that might have been run at the time. So, uh, for example, um, for the game Earthbound on the Super Nintendo, you guys probably have heard of Earthbound, right? It's not a very foreign game to you. Um, so, Earthbound was released in 1995, and these guys were working on a documentary about Earthbound, and I pulled out every review that ever ran for Earthbound, yeah. because we have that in the, in the VGHF library. And... Um, a lot, so I don't know if you guys know that Earthbound did not sell very well. Um, it was it was kind of a I don't know if it's a, a failure is the correct word, but like it, it was you know Nintendo wasn't pleased with the sales, which I think is probably why we never got Mother Three. Uh, I think the, the the poor sales of Earthbound probably tainted that, and um, so we were able to pull up these reviews to sort of contextualize what did critics think of Earthbound at the time? What how did people in 1995 Think of Earthbound, and, and you know, once you lay out all the reviews of Earthbound on a table in front of you, which I did, I literally did that, um, you start seeing trends, and what it kind of comes down to is most of the critics are like, the graphics are bad, the graphics are childish and bad, which sounds weird now, because I think we all love the art in Earthbound. It's, it's, it's got a style, it's a stylized game. Um, but then you start sort of, Again, this is all about contextualizing history, right? You start, you start looking around the time period. This is 1995. Uh, Earthbound debuted at E3 1995. In fact, the first E3, 1995. Um, what's going on in 1995? PlayStation's coming out. Saturn, I think, launched like at the show. Um, you know, it, like even if you went to Nintendo's booth at E3 1995. Um, even their Super Nintendo games were all in 3D. They had like Star Fox 2, uh, Comanche, FX Fighter. None of those shipped, by the way. They didn't ship any of those. Uh, but like everyone is just looking forward to E3. And then all of a sudden you have this 2D RPG that is itself a nostalgic throwback to the previous generation. It was just not the right time for Earthbound. Um, and that is a long, sort of lengthy, ranty way of explaining that, that you know, if we have access to materials, uh, we, can, we can start actually telling stories like, why didn't Earthbound sell? It was, probably wasn't that marketing. It was probably because, how the heck are you going to sell Earthbound in that environment? I think it probably was impossible. Um, and so what I want to talk about today uh, is, is a subject uh, that is uh, near and dear to me. Uh, which is the unshipped NES games library. Um, I had very good intentions of making a, a beautiful slideshow for all of you, and then uh, and then I didn't. So uh, so we're just gonna kind of wing it. But um, I, I I think I can make claim to being the foremost expert on the unshipped library for the NES in America. It's uh, I, something's very wrong with me. That, that this is just something that I just know way too much about. Um, 
And it really kind of goes back to uh, the early 2000s, like 2001, 2002. Uh, I, I had involved myself in, in what we might call ROM dumping groups. I was, I was a little pirate guy. Um, and um, I, I was also sort of getting into the idea of collecting vintage games. Um, and so those two sort of things in a, in a weird way combined where uh, I wanted to make sure every NES game was available to people on the internet because even back then I, I just understood that was important and, or maybe I just wanted to play them all, I don't know. Um, but also, you know, having started to collect games and, and I started noticing there were these sort of like ultra collectors who would, uh, who would uh, collect what we might call a prototype game, like uh, a, a cartridge that was never meant to be sold to anybody, uh, that, that was just used as a temporary thing to show off a game, like they would actually burn the game temporarily on a cartridge on, on ROMs. And uh, there were collectors who were buying uh, those ROM cartridges that had unreleased games on them. And uh, in many cases, this was the only copy known to mankind of an entire video game um, that was just in a private collection. And uh, I didn't like that. Um, I just, I, it, 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 to me, uh, I, I don't, unless you created that work yourself, like it just feels wrong to me that any human can be the gatekeeper for whether or not other humans can access this material. Um, and so I started a website um, with some friends in, in 2003 called Lost Levels. Uh, and Lost Levels, as far as I know, is the first game, uh, not the first game, the first website uh, dedicated specifically to unreleased video games. Um, and what we tried to do was not just track down and actually like copy these unreleased games so people could access them, but also we tried to tell their stories. We tried to find the people who were responsible for them and talk to them and try to understand why didn't these games ship? And, and then we did like four of those and then I got a real job and so the website kind of petered off. But, um, uh, you know, the, the preserving the history of this stuff um, has always stuck with me. And I mean, I mean, look, like I, I run a nonprofit now to do this. Um, I, I also have a career, just a side note, in the video game industry itself. Um, uh, I, uh, I was an editor on a couple websites on uh, One Up and Kama Sutra, and I've freelanced. You know, I, I wrote reviews and stuff way back in like the Game Boy Advance days, and um, I worked for a company called Game Tap. I don't know if anyone remembers Game Tap. Yeah, they, they, you're laughing. Like Game Tap was awesome. Um, Game Tap, if you if you guys didn't didn't experience it, it was kind of like Netflix is now, but for video games. So you paid us ten bucks a month, and we're like, here's a thousand games. Just stream whatever you want, going all the way back to the Atari, and then like games that came out six months prior. Um, Anyway, I was, I was there for a while, and then uh, I ended up, my, my, my sort of latest uh, gig that, that I got paid for um, was, uh, I, was a, I was a game producer and designer uh, at a company called Other Ocean and also our sort of spin-off label, Digital Eclipse. Um, I, I am the designer of, of uh, what is probably going to remain the only uh, official Sharknado video game uh, based on the sci-fi movie. Um, was it sci-fi? It was sci-fi, yeah. I should know. I had to work with those people, um, and I think what 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 I'm I, we, I, I worked on an uh, an Xbox One game called iDarb, uh, which is sort of an indie like platform Super Mario Brother basketball thing. That was it was a lot of fun. But but I think what I'm most known for are uh, a couple collections of classic games. I was I was the uh, producer on a on a product called Mega Man Legacy Collection, which was uh, oh, thank you very much the one person who who bought that. Uh, two, oh, two people have it. Thank you. Thank, uh, wow, there's like five people. That, that say, wow, this is great. Um, th and that was, um, yeah, it was a collection of the, the, the original six Mega Man games from the, from the, from the Nintendo Entertainment System um, that uh, we, we got running again on PS4, Xbox One, and uh, what else? 3DS. Uh, uh, Steam, also. There are four of them. Um, and then we also did a follow-up project that not nearly as many people bought, but you should, called the Disney Afternoon Collection. Um, and that was uh, the six, well, not the six, there were more than six, but there, it, was the, it was the six Capcom NES games that they wanted us to do. Um, and uh, so, but um, I'm not bringing these up just to like pitch them to you or whatever, but like, you know, th these titles, what we, what we tried to do with them was also 
uh, put a lot of bonus material into them to sort of contextualize these games within their history. Uh, with Mega Man, it was a bunch of concept art and stuff, but with Disney Afternoon, which no one saw, uh, it was really awesome because we had access to the material that Disney had sent Capcom like way back in the day. Like Capcom still had that. Um, so we were able to pull up like the original model sheets for the cartoons. Um, I, 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 I didn't know I was going to talk about this or I would have brought some slides, but um, like, you know, we were able to pull up like, okay, here's the model sheet for the mechanical bulldogs from from the Rescue Rangers episode, Catteries Not Included. And here are the sprites of the bulldog enemies from the first level of Rescue Rangers. And you can clearly see that Capcom like took the model sheets and interpreted them as pixels. And like, you know, we were able to show like storyboards from Darkwing Duck and stuff like that, and how that interpret, how the Capcom artists, you know, interpreted Disney back in the day and then translated it, I should say, um, which is great. And I guess, I guess if I have a point, I don't think I really do. Uh, my point is that uh, preserving history, even when I'm doing other stuff, just kind of tends to happen. You know, it's like we, we, we were just asked to do a Mega Man collection, and I was like, okay, I'm going to spend a, like a year of my life just digging up all the advertisements that ever existed, and then your lawyers are going to tell me to cut them out of the game. Um, uh, so, unreleased NES games. That's what we're here to talk about, I think. Um, I want to talk just briefly about why this subject in particular is really interesting to me. Um, so think back to the NES. It, I, I don't know how many of you were around for it. It seems like most of you, actually. Um, and you probably remember that the, the, the NES was huge. Like, everyone had an NES. There wasn't really a competitor. Sorry to the weird Master System kids that are in there. But, like, there wasn't really competition for the NES, and we all had one. And um, anyone who was a Nintendo licensee, anyone who was making games for the NES was making a boatload of money. Like, everyone was getting rich off this Nintendo trend. Um, and so, and, and, and in addition to that, uh, there, there are two other important factors that, that make the unreleased uh, NES games library very interesting. One of which is that if you were a Nintendo licensee, uh, Nintendo did not allow you to ship more than five new games in a year. Like, that was your hard cap. You couldn't, well, you could get around it if you were a claim, because the claim actually bought LJN, and they're like, no, it's a different company. So, like, that's how, that's why there's so many of those games. Um, but uh, that, was, that was your hard cap. And then the, the, the third thing is that game development was still relatively inexpensive. So you could afford to, you know, make a lot of product and not necessarily ship it. So a lot of, a lot of companies, would develop several games, like more than five games, and then only release the five that were maybe the best or the easiest to sell, and then they would shelve these other games forever. And so um, I think that's unique in video game history, where there's this weird concoction of scenarios that, that meant that games were created and, and, and uh, oftentimes completed and shelved because they just couldn't do anything with them. Um, and so, uh, and, and what, what ends up happening is that a lot of these games that didn't get shipped, um, you know, they're not all great, but some of them are very interesting. Um, and, and for me personally, a lot of these games are pretty weird, and I like that. I like weird games. Um, so, like I said, I started Lost Levels in 2003. Um, we started sort of tracking down and archiving these, these unreleased NES games. I, I don't know the exact count for for how many that we've touched or, or, or are online at least partially because of us, but it's somewhere like 30, which is like super significant. Um, and uh, I did a count before the talk. There are there are now 58 unshipped NES games that you can download, like online. That's 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 a lot. Um, and so. I sort of brought uh, three things that we could talk about. I'm not sure where I want to start, um, but actually, I, th I think I do know where I want to start. So, I recorded some movies of just some games that never that never came out here that I just find interesting that um, that I, that uh, I thought you guys might want to see. So, um, so this is one that that Lost Levels. Uh, uh, Acquired in 2003. This is California Raisins, The Grape Escape. Do you guys remember the California Raisins? Yeah. So, yeah, there's a theme song, right? They, they actually licensed it. 
Um, so the California Raisins, um, this was, uh, is, is the volume level okay with me talking? Do I need to turn it down? We good? Okay. So the California Raisins, this was actually like California Raisin Farmers as a group created these characters to make raisins cool so that you'd buy raisins. Like that's what the California Raisins were. And then like they licensed the cool raisins to the guys who made Mega Man to make a Nintendo game. Um, and so, you know, we have this weird, oh, you can moonwalk in the game. I don't know if you just caught that. If you hold to like, I'd probably do it way more later. Um, but, um, so this was sort of like in the early days of Lost Levels, in fact, the, yeah, you see that? Um, people were, this was, believe it or not, this was kind of considered a holy grail of the NES library. The reason being that uh, magazines reviewed this game. Uh, in fact, it made the cover of Game Players magazine. Like, and, and it had like a, a, a complete review and, and people were like, oh, this is a lost Capcom game. As it turns out, it's a lost game that Capcom paid someone else to make, but technically a Capcom game. Um, thank you for, the, for, for appreciating my moonwalk. Um, and uh, so this was sort of the first big win for Lost Levels, was that uh, we were able to uh, archive this game because um, a guy named Brandon uh, actually found it in a store. Like, someone was trading in these weird Nintendo games that have, like, they don't have labels on them. And I think the store didn't know what they were. They're like, oh, these are garbage games. We don't want your garbage games. But, like, he just happened to be there when someone was trying to trade them in. And he's like, these look interesting. I, I think, I don't know, California Raisins seems kind of cool. And he went home and looked it up. And he's like, oh my god, this game never came out. Uh, and he ended up, you know, talking to me and, and uh, sort of discussed his options with him. And then he ended up very generously allowing us to, uh, to uh, what we call dump the ROM, to, to copy the game, put it online, and that, uh, thereby make his, his extremely valuable one-of-a-kind cartridge kind of worthless. Um, which is just kind of how this, this stuff goes down. But uh, that's California Raisins. Um, uh, where should I go next? Where should I go next? Uh, block Out. That's the Block Master. He dares you to defeat him. Uh, so Block Out um, was a game that a company called California Dreams made uh, for computers and, and then licensed to Technos. I don't know if you guys know Technos. They did like River City Ransom and stuff like that. And this is sort of a 3D top-down Tetris, which um, not a great idea, really. Uh, it, and, and, and the hardest part about this version of it is that um, in the arcade, you had three buttons. Uh, one was to flip one way, one was to flip another way, and then one was to flip on the Y axis, right? In the NES version, you only have two buttons. Um, and so, like, moves that might take you one, or the two button presses on, in the arcade would take you three. And what I found was that uh, this game becomes impossible in later levels, because you can't press the buttons fast enough. Um, but. This is, this is a cool find because it actually has unique music that was only in the NES version um, and uh, a sort of a unique two-player mode that I didn't record video of and I really should have, but no one wanted to play block out with me. Um, okay. This is the very oddly titled Bashy Bazook Morphoid Masher. That, I think that guy's Bashy Bazook, I'm not sure. Uh, but he is uh, going in that time travel elevator there, and falling to his doom. I don't know why. I don't know his. I don't know Bashy Bazook's motivation for for going in the time time evader. But this is you know an action platform game that's sort of Metroidy, um, in the sense that there's some exploration. You go talk to these creatures who are actually really cool. Like they're, they're really cool creature design on these. Uh, this game did come out in Japan. I don't recall the name of it offhand, uh, unfortunately, but. Uh, this English version was being done by Jalico uh, in America, and, uh, you know, obviously they didn't release it or we wouldn't be talking about it right now. But, um, this, I like this game because, uh, I'm gonna, I'll, I'll tell you for a, a, a few different reasons, but the, the enemies you're fighting, they're sort of evolving, and the longer you take to get through a level, the more they evolve and the tougher they get, which I think is kind of an interesting mechanic, especially in a game where, oh, and I like, okay, look on the right, you see how there's that big drop? 
that's not a part of the map at all. That's just there to make it look bigger, which I think is actually kind of cool. Um, but uh, I forget what I was saying. But like, uh, oh, the, the time mechanic's really interesting to me because uh, this is a game that encourages you to explore and find all the secrets and yet is kind of punishing you for that. So I don't know, it's kind of a, it's kind of a weird mishmash of concepts. Um, I'm not, we're gonna watch all 10 minutes and 36 seconds of this, so just buckle down now or not. Um, oh yeah, okay, that, that's what I wanted to, hang on, I'm gonna rewind a little bit. Cause I, there's, there's dialogue with this guy that's, I really love, like I, I want more games to be written like this. Um, so at the, at the end of every hallway, there's an elevator and that's what takes you down to the next section. Um, and then, uh, kill Gamera real quick. Um, so the queen rabbit's hall, I guess. So it's downstairs, make sure you have enough energy, blah, blah, blah. Uh, but I really like this line. That's so good. <laughs> like that really fleshes out that world and makes you think like there are people who mop the stairs in, in like weird crustacean hell. Like this is, this, that's awesome. Um, so yeah, that's Bashy Bazook. This is a very, very difficult boss fight that I, I'm probably about to die in, I don't remember. Um, what else, what else, what else? What about Sun Man? Anyone here of Sun Man before? Yeah, a couple people. So Sun Man, great Sun Man. So Sun Man, um, Sun Man's a superhero. This is, this is not Sun Man. Um, this is the bad guy. That's Sun Man, he's concerned. Um, about the weird floating head. Sun Man, that logo kind of looks familiar. Um, yeah, right? It's Sunsoft. Sun Man. Um, so, yeah. Guy changes into a secret identity, flies around, hears a call for help, springs into action. That's sort of the game. Um, punches weird aliens or whatever. Um, but you can fly. This might look kind of familiar. Um, and that is actually because uh, originally this was, in fact, a Superman game. Um, I don't know if Sunsoft just lost the license for Superman or didn't think it was, you know, good enough to be a Superman game. But, um, you know, we're ended up, we, we have this sort of weird, you know, like attempt at making a non Superman Superman game that uh, they ultimately didn't ship. And this one, this one's a weird one because um, as far as I know, it was never announced or anything. And, and usually these games uh, tend to pop up, these unreleased games that are still on cartridge, tend to pop up in the United States, where which is sort of the, the hub of, of, uh, of, I should say, Western, uh, the Western video game industry. Uh, this cartridge was found uh, long ago in Spain, and I don't know why. I don't know why Spain, of all places, had this game, but there was a seller on eBay who was just slowly listing prototype video games. And, um, you, you know, for, you know, like early versions of released games, maybe. And I noticed he had a lot, so I emailed him. I was like, you have a list? He sent me a list. His list had like five unreleased games on it, and we bought them all uh, for a price that he was happy with, but shouldn't have been. Um, yeah, he even has that power. Look at that. <laughs> it's kind of vaguely like like the Chemco. I think it was Chemco uh, arcade game, but not really. Um, what else can we show? Oh, Drax Night Out. Okay. Drax Night Out is awesome. Um, look at that stupid horse. Drax Night Out, featuring the Reebok pump. <laughs> Um, so Dracula in his, is in his house, and there are people uh, with crosses, which, by the way, would never have shipped. Nintendo doesn't allow crosses. Um, and you sort of uh, spring traps and murder people and suck their blood, so they are dead. Uh, and Reebok was sponsoring this. Reebok was sponsoring a game where you run around and murder people, drink their blood, and then... Uh, uh, he's, so Dracula is not currently wearing the pumps, um, he, but there, there they are. <laughs> Let me just get this ghost to kill a couple guys first.
<laughs> I love this stupid game. Um, I didn't record the second level, which is hilarious in its, in its own right. Um, all right, so we open that door and then we get the pumps. And because it's the Reebok pumps, you go so fast and you jump real high. I mean, we all remember because we all got Reebok pumps, right? Like we saw, yeah, we were, like I was just slam dunking in fifth grade. It was amazing. Um, oh yeah, you turn into a bat if you suck enough, if you if you drink enough blood, uh, which is what I've done here. Um, do I get? Uh, I I did not get the. Oh, and when you have the pumps, you could actually jump on guys. You don't have to hypnotize them to get the. Uh, I think I just ate that shoe. Actually, that was weird. Um, so that is Drax Night Out. Um, oh, we're really getting through these, aren't we? Um, anyone know Euphoria? So this did come out in Europe, and I am showing you the European version because while we have archived an American version, it's not done, but this one is. Um, and this, this game was being advertised very heavily here. That garbage on the side of the screen, by the way, um, you, you would see that in Mario 3 also a little bit, depending on where your TV had its like mask, but you weren't really supposed to see that stuff on the, on the right. But um, this is a game done by Sunsoft back when Sunsoft was amazing, when they made games like Batman and then, well, Fester's Quest is not a great game, but it's neat. Uh, Blaster Master, um, Gremlins 2 is also really cool. They made well. They didn't make Sun Man. They like they they actually someone else made that for Sun Man. Um, but this is an this is an open world cutesy Metroidvania by Sunsoft in its prime. Like that. Like that. I don't know how else to sell a game to someone. Like that to me is like that is ex yes. That's exactly the game I want to play for the rest of my life. Is is a cutesy Sunsoft Metroid. Um, so this is Bob Louie. Uh, as you can see, he can uh, you can jump on guys and throw them, but we are about to have our first boss encounter, um, which suddenly switches the mechanics. Uh, that's spray on. Oh, the story is he can't find his friends. That's the story. Um, and uh, his friend wants to kill him. So you just kind of throw things at each other. I'm real good at this, so he might not get a chance. Um, but so in Metroid, you know, you find new power-ups as you go that, that allow you to uh, go into different places that you couldn't before. Oh, I got hit. Oh, oh I'm ashamed. That, that's a signature move. <laughs> I just want to show off all the features that you get hit, you know? Like, like I want you to see that hit animation. Um, oh, speaking of good dialogue, here's another good line. Um, not, not that line, not that line. <laughs> you know, you're the one who can walk on ice, right? Um, so now we can swim and, well, not swim, we can, uh, yeah, we can swim. Swim swim and walk on ice, but we can only swim on the surface. We got to get this other guy uh, to swim below the surface. But um, I think I show off his stupid crawl. But yeah, there we go. <laughs> Euphoria is great, you guys. And, and, um, the problem is if you get a PAL cartridge, that um, PAL meaning the European uh, standard, um, their, their televisions were slightly different than ours, so they had to retime the game. So it actually runs slightly too fast here. Um, so uh, emulator and set PAL mode to play it the way it's supposed to be, because I don't want that music to be playing too fast, because that music's great. Um, what else? I mean, you guys have seen Earthbound. I'm not going to show that. Um, OK, BioForce 8. Bioforce Ape. Um, you're about to see the entire storyline here. Family has monkey, mad scientist of ducks family, kicks monkey. Who is wearing a diaper? By the way, monkey's wearing a diaper, notice. So he's now a giant wrestling man in a diaper. He is drunk he drank a formula that he found on the street and became a wrestling monkey with a diaper. Look at this freakish animation. Look how good that is. Why? Um, so Bioforce Ape goes around uh, wrestling other Bioforce things, like Bioforce B here. So, and watch this, like, like I think the programmers at this company, Seta, just found a way to make the screen move real fast, and they're like, that's just what we're gonna do. Like, that's just, you just keep doing that. Um, and watch this, so you, you fall and then you land on a thing, and more fast movement. Look at his hair flapping, that's so good. Um, 
And it, so this is a game that, you know, was previewed in Nintendo Power. A lot of people, you know, a lot of us remember seeing it. And I, and I always thought it looked really weird. It's BioForce 8. And then we finally found the game. It was sold on uh, at auction in, 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 in Japan. Um, and I paid, uh, I paid, <laughs> paid a lot of money for BioForce 8 because I wasn't going to let it get away. Uh, this game is even weirder than I had. Look at this kangaroo. So, like, like it's, it's a kangaroo tail and a human torso coming out of the pouch using human arms as legs. And then, here we go. Yeah. That's it for BioForce Kangaroo. Um, the second stage is a minecart stage, because, of course. Uh, and then the third stage is, like, I didn't beat the game in the video or anything. But um, this is this is a very strange game. And it's it, it was, like, the same time as Sonic the Hedgehog. It's another, like, look how fast the thing is game. But, like, I don't think they had seen Sonic the Hedgehog. It kind of debuted at the same time. So that's a little bit interesting. I just kind of squeaked when I said that. That was neat. Um, what else? Titan Wars, maybe? Um, actually, this, okay. This one, uh, this is sort of a debut. Um, so no one's really seen this one before. There, there is a very, very early version of this game that you can get on the internet, but we, uh, we have since, uh, yeah. Here, okay, here's the storyline. Oh, it's the Ice Age. It's the Ice Age, we're probably gonna die now. Uh, wait, I have an idea. Let's play some hockey. Yeah. So, kind of a simple storyline, but you get it as dinosaurs playing hockey. Um, this was made by a company called Sculptured Software uh, for Sunsoft. So this is another one where it's a Sunsoft game technically, but they didn't make it. Um, and, uh, oh, I know it. I, I'm going to show you another Sculptured game after this. I'm already excited. Um, yeah, here we go. I, I actually, you know, this is really polished. It's not done yet. Like, it's a little buggy. It crashes after a while. Um, but it's a super charming little game. Um, I think so. Th th that's a that's a turtle in a shell, by the way, the puck, which is which is a little sad. And that's your goal. You, you shoot on the I don't know whatever that dinosaur is. I'm I'm not I'm not five, so I don't know what dinosaurs are called. Yeah, isn't that cool? Um, yeah, it's just fun little you know two player ish. You know, you don't have to be two-player. Two-player hockey game. Um, the intro is great, yeah. Um, that is dino hockey. Uh, I'm going to switch quickly because I just got excited to show you this other one, um, which is the Robin Hood. Where's my Robin Hood? Didn't I? Where is it? Oh, Legend of Robin Hood. That's what it's called. Okay. So, Robin Hood Prince of Thieves was a Kevin Costner movie. There was a Nintendo game based on it. But before they had licensed that movie, uh, they were actually doing this weirdly ambitious Robin Hood open world Zelda RPG. Um, and this is unfortunately not finished, but um, because like, if you follow the main quest line, it just kind of stops working. But I've been trying to beat it anyway. Like, I've been trying to like bug my way into it. And what I've determined is, if I can just get a sack of flour, there's a sack of flour item in the game uh, that you can't get by legitimate means, but if I could trick the game into getting me a sack of flour, uh, I, I, could, I could kill the bad guy and, and win this game. So here's Robin Hood. Uh, he's gonna look around. Gonna, his eye spies a club. Let's take that club. We eagerly grasp a club, sorry. Um, so now we can hit things with a club. Oh, after we, oh, it's already equipped. So if you play Prince of Thieves, it's sort of a similar menu. You hit people to talk to them, which is my favorite video game mechanic. So you talk to people, uh, you know, tell me some rumors, what's going on. Uh, remember King Richard? That, that guy was kind of cool. Maybe you can just kind of rob people if you want. Take it to my purse, it's outlaw it. Um, so we have money, we have a club. There's a bear in a tree. So I don't think bears actually stand on their hind legs and punch. I don't think that's a behavior known. Uh, but, oh, we now have some bear meat, um, which we can immediately stuff in our mouths if we want to. Yeah, dude. Always eat bear. Um, okay, watch this animation when this guy comes to talk to us. <laughs> um, he's he's going to do it again if you miss it when he leaves. <laughs> 
So this game is like super, it has a day-night cycle. I don't know what other, well, I guess Castlevania 2 sort of does, but um, like it's, you know, it's this big open world with a day-night cycle and just like throws you in and you just gotta figure it out. And it's actually really cool. And like, they were really going for something with this. And then for Prince of Thieves, they just took out all the interesting bits and just kind of made it a very linear experience, which I think is a little unfortunate. Oh, here's another uh, opportunity to, oh, I just drank some water. There's another opportunity to see that animation. <laughs> just a, that guy looks like he has money. Let's take it. I don't think there's a mechanic to actually give to the poor. Oh, so he called some guards, which is one of the mechanics here. It's a little broken. Um, I don't think we'll see any brokenness here, but I'm going to skip ahead a little bit. Um, so this road takes us to Nottingham. There's this giant town. Um, oh, here we go. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, you can go in shops and talk to people, you buy weapons, uh, and I don't know, I, I, I really like this game. Um, I don't know that if it, if, if it ever got stable, like if it ever got to the point where you could finish it. Uh, I emailed the programmer, I found him and asked, and I was like, was this ever finished? You know, asked him very specifically, did this game ever get far enough to where it was beatable? And, you know, his, his response was, yes, we made that game, and then it was canceled. You know, it was like, right, but did <laughs> that we, that version of the game, was it ever finishable? And then he didn't reply to that. And so I don't know if that was it. But uh, I'm going to beat this unbeatable game someday. Um, that's, oh, I got to show you Hit the Ice. thought I was done. There's so many cool games. Hit the Ice was a Taito ar uh, arcade hockey game. Uh, sort of, I think it was two on two plus a goalie. Sort of like, like NBA Jam in a way where it's just like, you know, uh, taking a sport and, 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 and whittling it down to arcade friendly elements. Um, but this has a quest mode. We are on a hockey quest. Um, this is our coach. I don't know his name. Uh, he has really good advice here. <laughs> <laughs> Hockey Quest. Look at this. Like it's a it's a weird. Oh yeah, you go into this guy's house and you have to pay him money, and then he tells you you have had 20 gold taken from you. Um, random hockey battles in the hockey RPG. Hockey teams like grab you and force you to play hockey, and uh, you get money and experience and stuff, and and upgrade your stats and things and. I just kind of get the feeling, look, look at the weird ghosts. Like, you see them in the audience? Like, what are those? Um, well, I guess I could have pointed to them. Um, let's hit the ice. Um, we're a little low on time, so I, I just want to briefly, um, so those are games that are available that didn't come out that you can find if you know where to look. Um, there's still some games that are lost that we just don't have. Um, and, I, and I sort of put together some, this isn't definitive or anything, but uh, you know, these are games that definitely were playable at least a little bit at some point in their lives that, that no one's found a copy of yet. So um, this is Ace Harding Lost in Las Vegas. This is Deja Vu 2. Um, I don't know if you guys played Deja Vu on the NES. It's sort of like a hard-boiled detective uh, uh, adventure game sort of thing. Now, Deja Vu 2 did come out uh, on computers, including the Mac where the, the original Deja Vu was, but I think it's unfortunate that this one has been lost because I think for a lot of people, NES Deja Vu was the definitive one, and it had that you know that wicked Chemco music score that might have also been in two. Uh, there is a, there is a score in the eventual Game Boy Color release of that game that I don't know if it's the same or not, um, but uh, that one I'd love to see someday. Um, oh, hang on, I got a little challenge for you. Uh, can you guys? Can you guys? Uh, can you guys guess who's coming to the NES? Um, I'll give you a minute, because there's some clues you can read uh, that might tell you a little bit. Um, anyone? What's that? Modin? I don't know. It's, you're close. It's John Madden. Very good. Yeah, you, uh, who was that? OK, you, you've just won yourself a beanie, my friend, for, for <laughs> defeating the Ubisoft Madden challenge. Uh, as an official Video Game History Foundation beanie available in the museum gift shop tomorrow. Um, 
So uh, Ubisoft was uh, doing a version of John Madden. On, I'm sorry, these are so small. I didn't have a chance to blow them up. But uh, they, they were doing Madden for uh, Madden 93 specifically for NES and Game Boy. Probably not a major loss, but I think it's kind of interesting that there was going to be an NES Madden, um, which a lot of people don't realize. Um, how yeah, about Police Academy? Remember Police Academy, those movies? Yeah. Um, so this was being done by Tengen. Are these, can you guys see enough detail with these small screenshots? I don't know if I can zoom in or not. Oh, I can zoom. Wait, how did I, there we go. Okay. Um, so this was actually based on the Police Academy cartoon, which was a thing. Um, and this was being done by Tengen, uh, which was a company that did not operate as a Nintendo licensee. They were, in fact, an unlicensed company, is what we call that. And um, I cannot tell what's going on in this screenshot. There's, like, severed heads planted in trees. Um, question block, I think I understand that iconography, but do you collect the heads? And if so, what's the one that's attached to a body? Do you, I don't, I don't, I do not know this game. Um, what's really interesting about this game, about Police Academy uh, on the NES, is that uh, there's two of them that didn't come out. Uh, this is the original, done by a programmer named Steve Woita. Thank you, we got five minutes. Um, and I'll hang out for a minute if you guys wanna uh, ask questions or whatever, but uh, in the hallway. But um, So Steve Woita was the programmer on this one. The way he explains it was that uh, it tested well, but they, they sort of gave it to another developer, which uh, did a more, uh, they described it as like a, more of a Mario 2 style game. Um, hang on, that was this, just a title screen. Which uh, also looks hideous. Um, so, I have no, the, is that, it's like a banana or a boomerang and you gotta beat 130 and drink a soda and there's spiky balls on balloons, I don't know. I. I cannot claim to have watched the Police Academy cartoon. Um, I did read about it on Wikipedia once, though, so I'm probably among the top percentile of, of experts in that game. Um, oh, Wild Boys. Wild Boys was a Bandai game. Oh, I don't have the ad. Oh, hang on, I gotta show you the ad. Hang on. I got a bunch of ads in here, too, but we are low on time, and uh, I'm gonna have to do this. Should I do this again next year, you think? Okay, all right, cool. Um, Wild Boys. Yeah. Oh, I didn't want to open Photoshop. <laughs> Go away. Um, fine. Fine Photoshop. Fine. We'll, we'll do it in Photoshop. Is it going to open some embarrassing things? No. Okay. Um, so Wild Boys was being advertised by Bandai. Um, you can see... Oh, I just deleted it. Okay. <laughs> That's them. That's the Wild Boys. <laughs> Um, uh, it's Keith, J slash, and Axel, <laughs> the wild boys. Uh, they got to rescue their hostage girlfriends because, of course, it's a video game, so the, a, 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 there's a damsel in distress. Are you wild enough to be a wild boy? Um, we'll never know. We'll never know because that game is lost. Um, but Nintendo Power did have a screenshot, so... I don't know, like, it looks like one of those. It looks like one of them double dragons. Um, but, uh, I mean, I, I love this stupid promo image for that. Um, what else, what's an interesting one we can do before we go? I mean, real quick, Space Ace, based on the Laserdisc game, was being done by the same guys who did the uh, vaguely Dragon's Lair-like Dragon's Lair game on the NES. Uh, I think it's the same guys, anyway. So they were doing a Space Ace like that also, I guess. Um, uh, oh, here we go. This one's good. Okay. Nightmare on Elm Street. I hear people going, wait, that game came out on the Nintendo. Yeah, a game called Nightmare on Elm Street came out on the Nintendo, not this one. Um, you are Freddy Krueger. Uh, find, yeah, a horde of obnoxious teenagers is trying to get rid of you. The only way to stop them is to kill them. <laughs> So they were, they were doing a game where you as Freddy murdered obnoxious children. <laughs> and who looked like that, by the way? I don't know. Like, that's not what children look like. Uh, that's some kind of block sculpture. But um, I don't know that this was, game was ever real. <laughs> you know, I don't know if they were just kind of making it up. But uh, that is obviously a thing that did not happen. And uh, I 
okay, real quick, what can we do, what can we do? I mean, there was a Lord of the Rings game. It's kind of, kind of weird that there's a lost Lord of the Rings NES game. Um, I don't know anything about it. Just what those screenshots look like is what I know. Um, yeah. Are there any unreleased games that you know exist and people are holding hostage or something like that? Uh, hostage is a harsh word. Uh, so <laughs> the question is, uh, are there any unreleased games that anyone owns that, that are sort of being held hostage? I wouldn't say that's the case, but uh, I do have an example here, actually, of... Uh... Wait, Funhouse, I hear you say. That one came out for the NES, not this one. Um, anyone ever play the Muppets game on NES? Like the, it's like probably the worst game on the system. Uh, it's worse than Circus Caper. <laughs> oh yeah, it, uh, yeah, you're right. Carn Chaos at the Carnival. Wow, I can't believe I pulled that out. Um, so this was being made by that same developer and uh, that's probably why it was canceled. It was probably really bad. Uh, there was a version of this that, there is, a, there is a prototype cartridge that exists of this cartridge. I'm not gonna say it's held hostage, that's not true. What happened though is that the person who found it uh, sold it to someone, and I don't know who that someone is. So to me, this game is sort of lost in the ether some way. If any of you bought this game, let me know. Let's work something out. Because um, I would love to preserve what's probably an even worse game than Muppets on the NES. Um, we could do maybe one question real quick if anyone has a question. Yes? What do you know about uh, SimCity on the NES? What do I know about SimCity on the NES? I know that it is here on the show floor. Um, that it was, uh, I don't know that I can speak to why this person has it, but someone, someone has the game. Um, and it was, uh, it was being developed sort of at the same time, yeah, we're, we're just finishing up right now. Uh, it was being done at the same time as the Super Nintendo version. They, they were gonna do simultaneously do an eight and 16 bit version. Uh, and if you're asking if we're gonna uh, archive that, I'm, I'm trying. I'm trying, but uh, those things are pretty expensive now. And uh, we, we we, while we are a nonprofit that is publicly funded and we have, we have, we have money, uh, I don't know if I have that much money, but uh, we're, it'll happen. Well, I mean, I, we haven't nailed it down yet, but I mean, I'm not gonna let SimCity get away, so don't worry. Thank you very much. I should say before drinking my water. Um, this was fun and there's even more to talk about than I even thought in 45 minutes, so we will do this again next year if you'll join me.